So, first thing, I'm hearing some uh, I'm hearing some rumblings that everybody's getting zero for the first part of the computer assignment, and that's one of the fun things about the assignment. Somebody, you know, people always get a zero. Um, so, I'll give you two thoughts. The first thought is um, the second part might be easier than the first part. It's a little less tricky. Is there a reason we're not getting? Projector doesn't look like it's on, does it? Um, projector power. Um, hold on a second. Let me see if I can figure out why we don't have a projector here. Laptop. Doesn't even look like it's trying, does it? Close. Room output. Close. Yeah. Yes? What can I do for you? What's that? Yeah. What do you mean it'll overflow? Figure something out. Everybody else does. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not no, it's like, it's like this, right? If I yeah. Have, if I have a cosine and I change it to an exponential, it's yeah. so long that it doesn't fit the count. Yeah, you can just have it, you can just, instead of, sorry here, instead of, yeah, just do like dot, dot, dot and go like to the next line. Yeah, you can finish the equation on the next line. I'm sorry, I'm having projector issues. Is it coming on now? This happened once to me uh, like last year. I couldn't get the projector to come on for the life of me. And then the, um, ah, ah, I know what the problem is. Um, I think I know what the problem is. So um, anyway, if that doesn't work, I'm going to have to call an audible here real quick. Okay, so there we go. There's a wrong input. Is it coming? Come on, dude. Why are you being like this? Um, okay, so anyway, I'm going to try to do two things at once. I'm going to try to talk while I get the projector to work. Um, so for the... First problem, so the second part actually might be a little easier because you're multiplying two functions together that are actually more likely to work. Um, for the first problem, uh, there's a little bit of a trick, and I've actually, believe it or not, um, I have posted a hint to Blackboard this morning. So, um, sorry, I'm trying to reset the system if you haven't figured that out. Um, so what you should do is read the hint and then see if you still have questions. Um, but essentially, I give an example of like why your answer is actually not coming out to zero. You're forgetting to use L'Hopital's rule um, is basically what the answer is. But it turns out there's even a smarter way where you don't even need to worry about L'Hopital's rule. So read the hint is sort of my, my advice to you. You say use L'Hopital's rule in an integral? Read the hint. Read the, read this. It's on Blackboard. Go to Blackboard, look under computer assignments, read the thing. Um, what am I going to do in class today if I can't get this projector to work? We could. All right. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little flustered here. I, um, it's, I can't use my laptop or the desktop, and good luck trying to teach this class without a computer. Um, okay, well, uh, I'll see if I can get it. To, I'm bummed. I have like a really cool demo for you today. Like I worked on it and stuff. Um, okay, we're going to have one last try here. Because in power on the, there should be a box under there that does the power to the conversions. If you can find a power on it, you can just set it. Power to there's no. It might be it might be um, all covered up and locked away. Yeah, it probably yeah. There's I mean everything here's got power running to it. I don't know that I can reset anything. Can you just turn the power off? No. 
<laughs> about that. <laughs> oh, it says the projectors. Okay, last shot here. Laptop. Send a projector. Still? What's that? No, I can turn the, those lights. I can handle. I mean, I can turn the whole room off um, easily. I can do that. Yeah, it's just the projector's not coming on. Um, let me try one last thing because otherwise this is going to be a bit of a waste of a lecture. I know there's a um, one time they told me to come back here and flip the breaker. Um, I promise I'll do no more than like two minutes of this, and then I'll actually just try to fake my way through a lecture. All right, let's see. Projector, breaker number 33. Okay, I just flipped the breaker on the projector. I can. Do I want to? Quad rack receptacles. I'm trying that. Number 39. Podium receptacle, number 40. <laughs> Can they fire me for this? <laughs> All right. Okay, well, oh, awesome. And I left the projector down, so if the system, um, if the system cooks itself, touch screen to activate system. <laughs> now I don't even have a screen to use. I abort <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. Oh, hold on. It woke up. Press here to enter the code. Laptop. It's like Jurassic Park when, when yeah. the system gets rebooted. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amused that people know about. Oh, yeah. Okay. I like how the answer is kill the power and give it power, yeah. Yeah. Whoever designed well, that system should fail senior design. Seriously. Um, OK, well, OK, so I think we're going to have something going shortly. So anyway, read the hint I left you on, uh, on Blackboard. I think it's, it's helpful. If you have problems, hit me up with email over the weekend, or we can talk Monday. You'll have plenty of time to sort it out. But don't get stuck, don't, don't get stuck on part one. Like, do part two if part one's giving you fits. Like, in some ways, it's a little more linear uh, in terms of being able to solve it. All right. What's that? Okay, you guys are so smart. All right. Now, so the purpose of this little demo that I want to do today is I want to motivate why we worry so much about cosines. Okay? That's like the one piece of the puzzle I haven't really gotten into. Like, what's, what's the infatuation with cosines? So they're easy to make. <laughs> why cosines? Okay, so here's what I've got. I've got a, I've got a circuit. And we're going to simulate it a little bit, all right? So I've got a resistor, I've got a capacitor, um, and I can, I can change whatever I put in here. I can put in a sine wave, a square wave, a sawtooth, whatever. So I'm going to start by putting in a, um, a sine wave. So I've got a kilohertz sine wave. I'm going to hit the simulate button. I'm going to hit run. Ugh, let's try. Oh, of course, all my screen dimensions are changed now. Hide. Okay. Let's... Um, Let's see here. Let's reduce the frequency a little bit. Let's make this, um, oh no, let's increase the frequency. Let's try reducing it. Let's see what happens. Simulate. Run. Hold on a minute. Hide. 100 hertz square wave. Oh, square wave. That's my problem. Sine wave. Simulate. Run. Okay, let's just run it for a little bit longer. Instead of 5 milliseconds, we'll run it for 50 milliseconds. Run. Okay. So I put in a sine wave. So the, the, let's see. The orange is my input. The blue is my output. So what do you notice? That, like, let's just talk about what we see. What, what, what's relevant about this uh, plot? Yes? It looks like there's a voltage drop across the resistor. There is a voltage drop across the resistor. Okay, that's one thing that's worth noticing. A little bit out of phase. 
Mm -hmm. frequency. Same frequency. Yes, but don't overthink it. We'll get to that. Okay. So here's what I need you to get out of this picture. The most astounding thing about this picture is that the output has exactly the same shape as the input. The input is a cosine. The output is a cosine. And they're at the same frequency. Think about that. Input and output are both cosines, and they're at the same frequency. They only differ with respect to the amplitude of the output and the phase shift of the output. Amplitude and phase are the only things that changed. OK. So now I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to make my, um, instead of 100 hertz, we're going to try 500 hertz. Sound good? Input's a cosine. Output is? Still a cosine, right? Same frequency? Same frequency. Very cool. What I, and then, and, but so the only difference is, is that the output has a different amplitude and a different phase shift than the input, right? OK. Is the amplitude smaller or bigger than it was a moment ago? Smaller. So I increased the frequency, and the output got smaller. Sorry? No, no, go ahead. Increase the frequency, reduce amplitude. So let's try one more time. Let's try 1,000 hertz. Yeah, we'll change it now. We don't, right, so we don't need to run it for 50 milliseconds now because it's so much faster. We'll run it for a little bit less. Even smaller. Let's up the frequency a little bit more. 5,000 hertz. even smaller. So what's the take home lesson here? What's happening? What is that? What kind of circuit is did I draw for you? RC. Is it a filter? This is a low pass filter. What does that mean? It means that it passes low frequencies, right? If we were to plot for this filter, if we were to plot like pass on this axis, like 1 means it's totally passed, and 0 means it's totally rejected. I think, and you know, I'm, this is a pretty vague term, and I'm purposely leaving it vague. What we might see is that at low frequencies, the signal gets passed, and at high frequencies, the signal is getting rejected. OK? And the other important thing is that cosine input always gave cosine output. OK. That's very important. Now. Let's, yes? You made a high pass filter, wouldn't that almost inverse our curve when we do the yep. frequency versus the thing? Absolutely. And we go start really small. And then you go big. And then you go big adding them up even? How do you mean adding them up? Uh, we were taking the waves and making them. Yeah. Oh, it changes the wave on the way out. So I'm kind of curious how a high pass filter would change the phase um, the magnitude. Well, it would just zero out the lower frequencies and pass the higher frequencies. And whatever that re re residual signal looks like, it looks like. Now, for a bypass, would you just swap out the capacitor for an inductor? You could do one of two things. You could either swap the cap for an inductor, okay. or you could stick with the resistor and the capacitor and just swap them. Okay. Either way will work. OK, now here's what I want to do. I'm going to take my sine wave, and I'm going to change it to, oh, I don't know, a square wave. OK, and let's go back to um, something pretty low frequency. So let's try like a 50 hertz signal and uh, run the simulation. So 50 hertz signal, that means the period is 20 milliseconds. So I'm going to run it for 100 milliseconds. Let's see if that winds up giving me anything usable. Shark fin. 
So I put in a, a square wave. Did I get out a square wave? No. No. Okay. So what's special about sine waves or cosines? Pure tone. Pure tone, but what's special with respect to the circuit? What you put in comes out. Okay. So why are we why are we losing all the sleep over cosines? The cosine is the only signal, the only signal that when you pass it through a linear circuit, you get the same signal out. Which is why we use it as a building block. Exactly. Yes. Is it, is it because um, you change the frequency of the cosine, it will still be a cosine, but mm -hmm. you change the frequency of many square waves, which is built of many cosines? Yes. Yes, that's exactly why. That's the whole point of this lecture. We can stop now. <laughs> um, hey, I was just telling the circuit students yesterday, uh, you know, if we get through the material in the semester earlier, we can just stop, right? I mean, so if we, get, if we understand today's lecture, we don't need to, I don't need to waste your time until 11, right? We just, anyway. Um, yeah, so okay, so, so let's talk about this. It, a cosine is the only signal that exists that when you pass it through a regular circuit, which means resistors, capacitors, inductors, for the most part, once you get diodes in there, it gets more complicated. But as long as you have linear elements in your circuit, the cosine is the only signal that comes out looking the same way as it went in. You put in a square wave, you don't get a square wave out. You put in a sawtooth wave, you don't get a sawtooth out. Right? So cosine is the logical building block to work with. Right? So let's put the pieces of the puzzle together. Okay? So we've not, we haven't actually solved for the Fourier series of a square wave, have we? I think maybe you did it in recitation. Uh, you, did. you did. Okay. And it's in the book. And... For, again, for the purposes of this conversation, I, I don't really care to actually know what the numbers are, right? I'm going to try to make my point just with hand waving. All right, hold, hold off a second. Okay, so. Did you also say that the box, that box that is doing the transformation knows what, so it, essentially something comes in, something comes out. Mm -hmm. You could follow it up with. Yeah. But in this case, it doesn't, it doesn't do that. Hold, off, hold on that thought. You, you're going to answer your own question in a second. Okay. So, for my, let's say I take my square wave. And I were to solve for A sub n. So suppose I actually did that. Okay. And I made a plot of frequency on the x-axis and amplitude of A sub n on the y-axis. What do you think roughly it would look like? It gets smaller, right? As I go to the right, my little sticks are going to get shorter and shorter. And again, I don't really care how high they are for the purposes of this example. So I got a big stick, and then maybe a medium stick, and then they get, they get smaller, okay? So this picture says, in words, how to build square wave out of cosines. Now, let's take this square wave and pass it through my filter. You with? Yeah. Watch, watch the magic. This stick is a cosine, is it not? What's going to happen to this cosine when I put it through my circuit? Right, so if I look at the output, here, so let me, let me try to, oh yeah, purple and red, you'll totally be able to tell these apart in the dark. Okay, so when I put this cosine through my, sig through my filter, we've just learned that cosines have this magical property that whenever you stick them through a circuit, you get the same cosine out, except maybe it would be a little smaller and there might be some phase shift. So this is a low-pass filter, and I'm going to guess that because this is in the pass band, that cosine will get passed out, and you'll get that cosine. And I've drawn them next to each other, but I mean to imply that they're at the same frequency, right? Okay. Now, what about this cosine? What's going to happen to that cosine when he goes through my filter? Yeah. First of all, I'm going to get a cosine out at the same frequency. It's just, it might be a little bit smaller. So maybe this cosine is going to look like that. Okay. 
Each one of these represents a cosine. And since I know that any one cosine gets transmitted through as a cosine, all I have to worry about is what happens to its, its, its amplitude. OK. So now let's look at the red, the red sticks. So if I compare the red sticks to the purple sticks, it looks like at low frequencies, I have roughly the same amount of stuff. But at high frequencies, I've totally, I've basically gotten rid of the high frequency sticks, right? Those are the ones that really got reduced. Does that, does that mesh with what you're seeing on the screen? Is that consistent? So remember the, the orange signal on the screen, right, remember we talked about where the low frequency portions and the high, right, so where, where is the high frequency portion of the, of the input signal? The corner, remember these edges are the really high frequency part. And these flat bits, that's the low frequency part. What this picture tells me is I'm passing the low frequencies and dumping the high frequencies. Is that not true? I mean, that's what the picture says. So look at the screen. What got passed? The low frequencies, the flat bit, right? That purple signal, the, the, the whatever, I don't know what you call that color. Um, aquamarine? No. Blue, we'll call it blue. Um, yeah, so you see how it flattens out? That's an indication that we're passing the flat part of the signal, the low frequency portion. What got rejected? The high frequency edge. Okay, that high frequency edge does not make it through the system. It got filtered away. See how all that fits together? So because the cosine has that property that it passes through the system as a cosine, it's the natural building block to think about, these, uh, to think about signals. All right? You take a signal, you break it into frequencies, then you look at the system you're working with, and you say, how does this system affect different frequencies? These frequencies get passed, these frequencies don't get passed, and then you can understand what's left. Okay, it all fits together. It's really very, I, I've, I'm always like, I was just, I'm impressed with how elegant it is. It just, I think it's, it's, a, it's a neat, neat kind of, um, that it all works out this way. So that's why we sweat cosines. Cosines are the natural building block to put all this together with. Questions? Yes? From a DC signal. For an oscillator, you would need a clock signal, so, right? Yeah, there, I, I'm actually not a, I don't know a ton about how you actually build sine waves. Um, you mean like in a circuit circuit? Um, well, you would, you would at least need something, something that has some AC components together, right? Right. Typic I, I think typically the way it works is you start with like a, a clock signal that just goes up, down, up, down, and then you, you like, you, you either filter it or you, you somehow use that. But you do need something that oscillates. I don't think you can just start with a square, with a, with a DC signal and, and like work your way over to it. But it's a good question. But you can go from um, one signal into two of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll, and we'll get to that. OK, look at this picture. Actually, ooh, maybe we can do this. Uh, plot export to Excel. Am I running Excel? OK. Hold on a second. So basically, I'm just exporting this data to Excel so I don't lose it. Uh, and they make it challenging for me, because that's the kind of. So you can scale this by a function to get the, the filter output? Like, so you take a function and say, like, x is equal to, like, negative whatever, like, a line for the frequency content, then you can get out your signal by doing the inverse? Or yeah, 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 yeah. And this is all, I mean, this is basically what we're talking about all, like, we're going to talk about all semesters. We're, like, I really have no goal for this semester other than understand this process backwards and forwards and all the different ways that it can manifest itself. Okay, okay so all, all I'm doing here, I've just copied the data to Excel. Um, because in a minute I'm going to rerun the simulation, but I don't, I don't want to lose the plot. Okay, so by the way, this tool is awesome. It's called CircuitLab. It's online, circuitlab.com. I think a couple of undergrads at MIT wrote it. Um, it's not as powerful as multi-sim. Like, it can't do quite as much stuff, 
But holy cow, like for little RC circuits like this, it's awesome. <laughs> it's like so easy to use. And uh, multi-sim doesn't run on a Mac, and you know I'm using a Mac, so blah, blah, blah. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep the square wave at 50 hertz. I'm going to keep the cap at a microfarad. I'm going to change the resistor value. So I am going to go from a kilohertz to, um, I'll, I don't know, let's try um, 200 hertz. Let's see if... Let's see if we can deduce what happened. Wait, do you need to change the resistance or do you want to change the frequency? Nope. I want to keep the clock, I want to keep the input exactly the same. I just want to change the resistor. Okay. Okay. Let's um hold on. Let's uh let's go to Excel. Copy. Uh, I don't know, let's paste that. And oh, that time it worked. Did it copy the same values? Copy, paste. Hmm? Okay, well, let's try plotting and see what happened. Huh? Hold on. Hold the line. Scatter smooth. There we go. Actually, you know what we should do? Here, let me do one last plot here. What we really need to do is, uh, so this is, v in, this is V out for uh, 1K, and this is V out for 200 ohms, right? So let's plot this versus this, this, and this. Scatter. Hit me, baby. Okay, let's put it all to its own chart. And I am the king of Excel. Okay, can everybody see what's happening here? So the red signal is my input. The blue signal is my output when the resistor was a kilohertz. And the barely visible orange signal is my output when I change my resistor to 200 hertz. So my question to uh, 200 um, ohms. Yes, I was going to get there. Thank you. Okay, so my question to you is, what happened to my low, do I still have a low-pass filter? Yes, okay, I still have a low-pass filter. So what I want to know is, if this was my, okay, so this is the, this is the pass, like, like the diagram for my first low-pass filter. When I, when I decrease the resistor, from 1,000 to 200. What happens to this curve? Does it go to the left or to the right? right. Oh, there's some, there's some debate. Someone said left and someone said right. Yeah, so it's higher frequency now because the curve shifted closer to the edge where we know it's a higher frequency. Right. I'm, getting, I'm doing a better job of tracking the edge. Right. You see how the, the orange signal is almost going all the way up in the corner? It's doing a better job of tracking the edge, which means that I must be passing more high frequencies, okay? Because I know that edges are high frequencies. So that means that by reducing my resistor, I've somehow taken this curve, it's still a low pass filter, but I've, I'm somehow able to tweak it to program which frequencies get passed and which frequencies get rejected. So it looks that by increasing, sorry, decreasing, By decreasing my resistor, I shift to the right that curve, and I, decreasing R means I pass more high frequencies. Cool, right? There's almost, a, there's actually a formula. That was dramatic. There's a formula that actually lets you say, if I want to pass this frequency and reject those frequencies, you could even... Uh, too complicated. It actually turns out that your, um, your cutoff frequency in radians per second is equal to 1 over, one over RC. 
And the cutoff frequency by... I'm not doing well today. And by definition, the cutoff frequency is that frequency where the output equals 0.707 of the in, times the input. Why 0.707, you ask? Yeah, it's, um, it turns out it's the half power point. Half power. So, and trust me, we'll talk about it until it comes out of your ears later on. But basically, uh, the half power point is, like, the output has gotten smaller enough to the point where it contains half the power that the original signal had. Okay, and that's, hap that happens, the half power point happens when the output is root 2 over 2 times the input. Okay, do you want to see if that works real quick? Should we just test that? So let me go back to my circuit. I'm going to, uh, so I'm going to go put in a cosine again. Uh, cosine. And what frequency, if I want to put in a, a cosine that's at the cutoff frequency, what would that frequency be? All right, so according to, according to, to this, the cutoff frequency of this circuit is 1 over... 200 ohms times a microfarad, right? 1 times 10 of the... What? what? Negative 6. No, just don't, don't apologize to me. I mean, she's got to learn it, that's all. Okay, so, okay, so let's see. 1 over 200. Oh, my goodness, who has a calculator? Usually I like to showboat with doing math in my head, but I'm a little tired today. What's that? 0.5. Oh, I could do this in my head. All right, that's 6, 5, 4. So it's 0.5 times 10 to the 4. 0.5 times 10 to the 4, which is 5, 10 to the 3, which is 5,000. 5,000 watts? Rads per second. And since I don't have a button here that lets me program my frequency in rads per second, I actually need to get my frequency in hertz. So what's that? So 5,000 rads per second in hertz divide by 2 pi, right? Always, always divide by 2 pi. So we said 1 over 200 times 1 e minus 6. Okay, answer over 2 pi. So my frequency is 795 hertz. So I'm, I'm arguing, the, I think the cutoff frequency of this circuit is 795 hertz. So I'm going to test that hypothesis by actually stimulating it with 795 hertz. And I'm going to simulate it. And if it's true, my output will be exactly 0.707 as big as my input. Whoa. OK, I didn't think I needed to go quite as long. Uh, maybe we'll try, uh, I don't know, 25. What's the N? Milli. Okay, good enough. I'm going to put my cursor on the blue one. Is my output 0.707? It's 0.678. Mm. Actually, how do I know that I'm getting... It's actually pretty close. Let's see. Uh, export. No, I don't want to export it. What I want to do is... I'm still learning my way. Let me get rid of the um, input voltage. Maybe that'll make it a little easier to plot. Yeah, it's pretty close. It's right. It's just shy of 700, right? And so that means it's just shy of 0 0.707. So that's pretty good. That fits my hypothesis. That's pretty cool, right? I mean, there's like a lot of moving pieces here. Okay, and you're going to kind of have to... I think go home and kind of meditate on this, right? There's like a whole, all these pieces to the puzzle. So what was your input? My input was a, a cosine at um, 795 hertz. And 795 was what I believe to be the cutoff frequency of the circuit. So, um, 790, if I make it 795.7, you think it'll let me do that? Yes, it does. Run. Maybe I'll get exactly 0.707.
It's hard being this anal retentive. It's a lot of work. It's pretty close. Do you mean that you will get um, 707? Yeah, 700. This, it's saying 698 milli. That's the same as point six hundred and. It might be. It may be. No, there is. It is tracking series resistance, but it's not. Uh, it's not. They're all zeroed out. So, hmm. but why is it not exactly? That's going to bother me. Okay. Up here? Right. So remember, so you should have learned in circuits, too, that like the, whenever you solve a circuit, there's always the, the homogeneous response, which is like the initial transient, and then you have the steady state solution. And what you're seeing here is the initial transient that, that decays away pretty quickly. You got a number down there that I think is different from Audrey. Yeah, this number? Oh, this number? I need to wait longer. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm not going to lose, I am going to lose sleep over it, but I'm not going to lose sleep over it on your time. Okay, um, so, anyway, so, yeah, so to summarize and to state it again, because I don't think you can overstate it, the reason we break, the reason we worry about building signals out of cosines is because cosines have this property that when you pass them through a circuit, they come out exactly the same shape. They just come out a little bit smaller. So if we, A, can understand how to make, take a signal and build it out of cosines, and if we, B, can understand our system in terms of how it operates on cosines of different frequencies, we can combine those two pieces of information to quickly and intuitively predict what the output of the system will look like. This is a low-pass filter. My signal has low-frequency signals and high-frequency signals. If I get rid of the high-frequency components, which is what the low-pass filter does, I'm just going to be left with the low-frequency components of my square wave, and then I can make a prediction as to what that's going to look like. All right. I can change this back to a, uh, a sawtooth, right? And we can have the same conversation. If I change it back to a uh, 50 hertz sawtooth, and I'm going to put this back at a kilohertz, hit simulate, right? We can have exactly the same conversation. Ooh, fun. Hide. Let's put this back at 100. Let's also make sure we look at the input and run. OK, does this make any sense? Okay, sawtooth, it, low pass filtering it, which means we're taking out the high frequency components of the sawtooth. Okay, well, we're tracking the low frequency portion of the sawtooth pretty well. It falls apart though when the sawtooth has its high frequency edge, that's when the filter can't keep up. Why? Because the cap takes time to charge and discharge. Okay, that's where, the, that's where the delay is happening, right? The capacitor holds charge, and you're trying to say, I need the voltage across that cap to change quickly. And the cap says, well, I've got to dump all these electrons somewhere. I've got to dump them out through this resistor. That takes time. Okay? The amount of time that takes depends on the relationship of the size between the, cap of the, the size of the cap and the size of the resistor. Okay? If you change the size of the resistor or the cap, the circuit is either able to dump or charge the, the charge on the cap more quickly or more slowly. And that's where you get these, the programmable frequencies. Is that the RC time? That's the RC constant. That's exactly it. Which is just right. It's time. So there you go. All right. You can do the same thing with any other circuit. Okay. Let's have a quiz.